Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome back. <coughs> hey, Shobha. Hare Krishna. Welcome back to the daily readings of Srila Prabhupada's book here in the live studio at 3402 Radha Lane, 77018, right down the street from Sri Sri Radha Nila Madhavi's temple. And you can even send a package. You could try that address. It works. Yes, 3402 Radha Lane, 77018. Send those cards and letters coming in, folks. Okay. <coughs> and we've got a room full of Rasika devotees. Rasika devotee means those who like Rasa. They like the juice. They like the taste of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. And we aspire for their association. Hare Krishna. <coughs> And we've reached the 12th chapter of the 4th canto. But before we go any further, we're going to hear Srila Sanatana Goswami's prayer glorifying the Srimad Bhagavatam. And it goes like this. Sarva chasya viti yusha sarva vedaika sattvala sarva siddhanta ratnaja Sarva Lokai Kadritprada. O nectar from the ocean of all scriptures, singular fruit of all the Vedas, rich mine of the precious gems of all conclusive truth, you are the only giver of sight to all the world. Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Srimad Bhagavata Prabhu, Kalidvan Dodita Krishna Parivartita. O life heir of all the Supreme Lord's devotees, O Master, Srimad Bhagavatam. You are the son of Kali. You are the exact image of Sri Krishna. Paramananda Pataya, Prema Varshaksharayate, Sarvada Sarvasevyaya, Sri Krishnaya Namostume. I bow down to you, who were supremely blissful to read. Your every syllable pours down a flood of prema. You can always be served by everyone. You are Sri Krishna Himself. Mareka bando matsangin, manguro man mahadana, manistadaka mat bhagya, mat ananda namostute. My only friend, my constant companion, my spiritual master, my great wealth, my savior, my good fortune, my source of ecstasy, I bow down to you. Asadu saduta dayin, atini chochatakara, hanamun chagadachin mam, prem narit gantayospuda. O bestower of saintliness to the unsaintly, O exalter of the most fallen, please never leave me. Always appear in my heart and my voice with pure love. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we've heard the adventures of Maharaj Dhruva from the time he was a little five-year-old boy until now when he's the king of the world and now we've reached the 12th chapter in his adventures and this is a very important chapter it's called Dhruva Maharaj goes back to Godhead text one <clears throat> the great sage Maitreya said my dear Vidura Dhruva Maharaj's anger subsided and he completely ceased killing Yakshas. When Kuvera, the most blessed master of the treasury, learned this news, he appeared before Dhruva. While being worshipped by Yakshas, Kinaras, Charanas, he spoke to Dhruva Maharaj, who stood before him with folded hands. This is the difference between spiritual anger and material anger. Even though he was angry 
over the top, he was still spiritual. So he immediately said, yes, okay, I won't, I'll stop. And then he's standing in front of Kuvera. Who, the Yakshas are all Kuvera's people, you know. So these are what happens when big people have something not toward, not so nice. When they get together, they immediately <coughs> give each other pure devotion. Text two. The mas Hare Krishna, Hare Bhagavad George. <coughs> the master of the treasury. <clears throat> Hare Krishna. What's your name? Carlos. Carlos. Yes. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hare Krishna. Mm. Text two. <clears throat> the master of the treasury, Kubera, said, O sinless son of a Chatriya, I am very glad to know, to know that under the instruction of your grandfather, you have given up your enmity, although it is very difficult to avoid. I am very pleased with you. Text 3. Actually, you have not killed the Yakshas, nor have they killed your brother. For the ultimate cause of generation and annihilation is the eternal time feature of the Supreme Lord. Purport. When the master of the treasury addressed him, addressed him as sinless, Dhruva Maharaj, considering himself responsible for killing so many yakshas, might have thought himself otherwise. <coughs> Kuvera, however, assured him that factually he had not killed any of the yakshas. Therefore, he was not at all sinful. He did, he did his duty as a king, as it is ordered by the laws of nature. Nor should you think that your brother was killed by the Yakshas, said Kuvera. He died or was killed in due course of time by the laws of nature. Eternal time, one of the features of the Lord, is ultimately responsible for annihilation and generation. You are not responsible for such actions. Text 4. Misidentification of oneself and others as I and you on the basis of the bodily concept of life is a product of ignorance. This bodily concept is the cause of repeated birth and death and it makes us go on continuously in material existence. Purport. The conception of I and you, ahang tuam, as separate from each other, is due to our forgetfulness of our eternal relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Supreme Person, Krishna, is the central point, and all of us are his parts and parcels. Just as hands and legs are parts and parcels of the whole body. When we actually come to this understanding of being eternally related to the Supreme Lord, this distinction, which is based on the bodily concept of life, cannot exist. The same example can be cited herewith. In the service of the whole, the hand is the hand and the leg is the leg. But when both of them engage in the service of the whole body, there is no such distinction as la hands and legs, for all of them belong to the whole body, and all the parts working together constitute the whole body. Similarly, when the living entities are in Krishna consciousness, there is no such distinction as I and you, because everyone is engaged in the service of the Lord. Since the Lord is absolute, the services are also absolute. Even though the hand is working one way and the leg is working another way, since the purpose is the Supreme Person Personality of Godhead, they are all one. This is not to be confused <clears throat> with the statement by the Mayavadi philosopher that everything is one. Real knowledge is that hand is hand, Leg is leg, body is body, 
and yet all together they are one. As soon as the living entity thinks that he is independent, his conditional material existence begins. The conception of independent existence is therefore like a dream. One has to be in Krishna consciousness. Your chair is waiting for you, Kalpatru, because of all the nice prasadam you gave me today. <laughs> it was so nice. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. She's like my mother. She's always feeding me. Hare Krishna. <clears throat> as soon as the living entity thinks that he is independent, his conditional material existence begins. The conception, of independ in, the conception of independent existence is therefore like a dream. One has to be in Krishna consciousness, his original position. Then he can be freed from material bondage. Text 5. My dear Dhruva, come forward. May the Lord always grace you with good fortune. The Supreme Personality of Godhead who is beyond our sensory perception, is the super-soul of all living entities, and thus all entities are one, without distinction. Begin, therefore, to render service under the transcendental form of the Lord, who is the ultimate shelter of all living entities. Purport. Here the word bigraham, having specific form, is very significant for it indicates that the Absolute Truth is ultimately the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is explained in the Brahma Sangita, such Chidananda Bigraha. He has form, but his form is different from any kind of material form. The living entities are the marginal energy of the Supreme Form. As such, they are not different from the Supreme Form, but at the same time, they are not equal to the Supreme Form. Dhruva Maharaj is advised herewith to render service under the Supreme Form. That will, that will include service to other individual forms. For example, a tree has a form, and when the water is poured on the root of the tree, the other forms, the leaves, twigs, flowers, and fruits, are automatically watered. The Mayavad conception that because the Absolute Truth is everything, he must be formless, is rejected here. Rather, it is confirmed that the Absolute Truth has form, and yet he is all-pervading. Nothing is independent of him. Text 6. Engage yourself fully, therefore, in the devotional service of the Lord. For only he can deliver us from this entanglement of materialistic existence. Although the Lord is attached to his material potency, he is aloof from her activities. Everything in this material world is happening by the inconceivable potency of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Purport. In continuation of the previous verse, it is specifically mentioned here that Dhruva Maharaj should engage himself in devotional service. Devotional service cannot be rendered to the impersonal Brahman feature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Whenever the word bhajaswa appears, the meaning engage yourself in devotional service, there must be the servant, service, and the served. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is served the mode of activities to please him is called service, and one who renders such service is called the servant. Another significant feature in this verse is that only the Lord and no one else is to be served. That is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Mam ekam sharanam braja. There is no need to serve the demigods who are just like the hands and legs of the Supreme Lord. When the Supreme Lord is served, the hands and legs of the Supreme Lord are automatically served. 
there is no need of separate service. As stated in Bhagavad Gita 12.7, Tesham aham tsimudartha mrityu sangsara sagarat. This means that the Lord, in order to show specific favor to the devotee, <coughs> directs the devotee from within in such a way that ultimately he is delivered from the entanglement of material existence. No one but the Supreme Lord <coughs> can help the living entity be delivered from the entanglement of this material world. The material energy is a, is a manifestation of one of the Supreme Lord's personality of Godhead's where am I? Is that right? The material energy is a manifestation of one of the Supreme Personality of Godhead's varieties of potencies. Parasya, Shaktir, Vibhidaiva, Shruyate. This material energy is one of the Lord's potencies, as much as heat and light are the potencies of fire. The material energy is not different from the Supreme Godhead, but at the same time, he has nothing to do with the material energy. The living entity, who is of the marginal energy, is entrapped by the material energy on the basis of his desire to lord it over the material world. The Lord is aloof from this, but when the same living entity engages himself in the devotional service of a Lord, then he becomes attached to this service. This situation is called yuktam, for devotees, the Lord is present even in the material energy. This is the inconceivable potency of the Lord. Material energy acts in the three modes of material qualities, which produce the action and reaction of material existence. Those who are not devotees become involved in such activities, whereas devotees who are dovetailed with the Supreme Personality of Godhead are freed from the such action and reaction of the material energy. The Lord is therefore described herewith as Bhava Chidam, one who can give deliverance from the entanglement of material existence. Text 7 <clears throat> My dear Dhruva Maharaj, son of Maharaj Uttanapad, we have heard that you are constantly engaged in transcendental loving service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is known for his lotus navel. You are therefore worthy to take all benedictions from us. Please, therefore, ask without hesitation whatever benediction you want from me. Purport. Dhruva Maharaj, the son of King Uttanapad, was already known about the, throughout the universe as a great devotee of the Lord, constantly thinking of his lotus feet. Such a pure, uncontaminated devotee of the Lord is worthy to have all the benedictions that can be offered by the demigods. He does not have to worship the demigods separately for such benedictions. Kuvera is the treasurer of the demigods, and he is personally offering whatever benediction Dhruva Maharaj would like to have from him. Srila Bilvamangal Thakur stated, therefore, that for persons who engage in the devotional service of the Lord, all material benedictions wait like maidservants. Mukti Devi <clears throat> is just waiting at the door of the devotee to offer liberation, or more than that, at any time. To be a devotee is therefore an exalted position. Simply by rendering transcendental loving service under the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one can have all the benedictions of the world without separate endeavor. Lord Kubera said to Dhruva Maharaj that he had heard that Dhruva was always in samadhi or thinking of the lotus feet of the Lord. In other words, he knew that for Dhruva Maharaj there was nothing desirable within the three material worlds. He knew that Dhruva would ask for nothing but to remember the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord constantly. <laughs> Text 8 The great sage Maitreya <clears throat> The great sage Maitreya continued 
my dear Vidura, when, that a- when thus asked to accept a benediction from Kuvera, the Yaksharaj, king of the Yakshas, Dhruva Maharaj, that most elevated pure devotee, who was an intelligent and thoughtful king, begged that he might have unflinching faith in and remembrance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. For thus a person can cross over the ocean of nations very easily, although it is very difficult for others to cross. Purport. According to the opinion of expert followers of Vedic rites, there are different grades of benedictions in terms of religiosity, economic development, sense gratification, and liberation. These four principles are known as Chatur Vargas. Of all the Chatur Vargas, the benediction of liberation is considered to be the highest in this material world. To be, a sta- to be enabled <clears throat> to cross over material nations is known as the highest Purusharta, or benediction for the human being. But Dhruva Maharaj wanted a benediction which surpasses even the highest Purusharta, liberation. He wanted the benediction that he might constantly remember the lotus feet of the Lord. This stage of life is called Panchama Purusharta. When a devotee comes to the platform of Panchama Purusharta, simply engaging in devotional service to the Lord, the fourth Purusharta, liberation, becomes very insignificant in this age, in his, in his eyes. Panchama means, by the way, the fifth. This is the fifth Purusharta, above the four Purushartas of material existence. Srila Prabodhananda Saraswati has stated in this connection that for a devotee, liberation is a hellish condition of life. As for sense gratification, which is available in the heavenly planets, the devotee considers it to be a will of the wisp, having no value in life. Yogis endeavor to control the senses, but for a devotee, controlling the senses is no, is no difficulty at all. The senses are compared to serpents, but for a devotee, the serpent's poison teeth are broken. Thus, Srila Prabodhananda Saraswati has analyzed all kinds of benedictions available in this world. And he has clearly declared that for a pure devotee, they are all of no significance. Dhruva Maharaj was also a Maha Bhagavata, or a first class pure devotee. And his intelligence was very great, Maha Mati. Unless one is very intelligent, one cannot take to devotional service or Krishna consciousness. Naturally, anyone who is a first class devotee must be a first class intelligent person, therefore, and therefore not interested in any kind of benediction within this material world. Dhruva Maharaj was offered a benediction by the king of the kings. Kuvera, the treasurer of the demigods, whose only business is to supply immense riches to persons within this materialistic world, as is, as is described as the king of kings, because unless one is blessed by Kuvera, one cannot become a king. <laughs> the king of kings personally offered Dhruva Maharaj any amount of riches, but he declined to accept them. He, he is described, therefore, as Mahamati, very thoughtful or highly intellectual. <coughs> Text 9. The son of Uddhavati, I'm sorry, the son of Idavida, Lord Kuvera, was very pleased, and happily he gave Dhruva Maharaj the benediction he wanted. Therefore, thereafter, he disappeared from Dhruva's presence, and Dhruva Maharaj returned to his capital city. Purport. Kuvera, who was known as the son of Idivida, is very interesting, did you note? Even the biggest personalities are known by their mothers, by being the son of their mothers. 
<laughs> That's the way it is. Kuvera, who is known as the son of Idavida, was very pleased with Dhruva Maharaj because he did not ask him for anything materially enjoyable. Kuvera is one of the demigods, so one may put forward the argument, why did Dhruva Maharaj take a benediction from a demigod? The answer is that for a Vaishnava, there is no objection of take, to taking a benediction from a demigod if it is favorable for advancing Krishna consciousness. The gopis, for example, <coughs> worshipped Katyayani, a demigoddess, but the only benediction they wanted from the goddess was to have Krishna as their husband. A Vaishnava is not interested in asking any benediction from the demigods, nor is he interested in asking benedictions from the Supreme Personality of Godhead. It is said in the Bhagavatam that liberation can be offered to the Supreme Person. It is said in the, in the Bhagavatam that liberation can be offered by the Supreme Person, but even if a pure devotee is offered liberation by the Supreme Lord, he refuses to accept it. Dhruva Maharaj did not ask Kuvera for transference to the spiritual world, which is called liberation. He simply asked that whatever he would that wherever he would remain, whether in the spiritual or material world, he would always remember the Supreme Personality of Godhead. A Vaishnava is always respectful to everyone. So when Kuvera offered him a benediction, he did not refuse it, but he wanted something which would be favorable to his advancement in Krishna consciousness. Text number 10. As long as he remains at home, as long as he remained at home, one second, as long as he remained at home, Dhruva Maharaj performed many great ceremonial sacrifices in order to please the enjoyer of all sacrifices, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Prescribed ceremonial sacrifices are especially meant to please Lord Vishnu, who is the objective of all such sacrifices and who awards the resultant benedictions. Purport. In Bhagavad Gita 3.9 it is said, Yajyar tat kamanonyatra lokoyam kamabandana. One should act or work only in order to please the Supreme Lord. Otherwise, one becomes entangled in the resultant reactions. According to four divisions of Varna and Ashram, Kshatriyas and Vaishyas are especially advised to perform great ceremonial sacrifices and to distribute their accumulated money very liberally. Dhruva Maharaj as a king and ideal Kshatriya performed many such sacrifices, giving very liberally in charity. Kshatriyas and Vaishyas are supposed to earn, mon earn their money and accumulate great riches. Sometimes they do it by acting sinfully. Kshatriyas are meant to rule over a country. Dhruva Maharaj, for example, in the course of ruling, had to fight and kill many yakshas. Such action is necessary for Chatriyas. A Chatriya should not be a coward, and he should not be nonviolent. To rule over the country, he has to act violently. Chatriyas and Vaishyas are therefore especially advised to give in charity at least 50% of their accumulated wealth. In Bhagavad Gita, it is recommended that even though one enters the renounced order of life, he still cannot give up the performance of yagya, dana, and tapasya. They are never to be given up. Tapasya is meant for the renounced order of life. Those who are retired from worldly activities should perform tapasya, penances, and austerities. Those who are in the material world, the chatriyas and vaishyas, must give in charity. Brahmacharis, in the beginning of their lives, should perform different kinds of yagyas. Dhruva Maharaj, as an ideal king, practically emptied his treasury by giving charity. A king is not meant simply to realize taxes from the citizens <laughs> and accumulate wealth to spend in sense gratification. Hmm. <sighs> 
world monarchy has failed ever since kings began to satisfy their personal senses with the taxes accumulated from the citizens. Of course, whether the system is monarchy or democracy, the same corruption is still going on. At the present moment, there are different parties in the democratic government, but everyone is busy trying to keep his post or trying to keep his political party in power. The politicians have very little time to think of the welfare of the citizens whom they oppress with very heavy taxes in the form of income tax, sale tax, and many other taxes and shutdown of government. Oh, excuse me. I got, I got carried away there. Sorry. Sorry. People have sometimes, people sometimes have 80 to 90 percent of their income taken away. And these taxes are lavishly spent for the high salaries drawn by the officers and rulers. Formerly, the taxes accumulated from the citizens were spent for performing great sacrifices, as enjoined in the Vedic literature. At the present moment, however, almost all forms of sacrifice are not at all possible. Therefore, it is recommended in the Shastras that people should perform Sankirtan Yagya, did you read? I read a figure, statistic, statistic the other day. Now, 26 men have the same accumulated wealth as 3.8 billion people on this earth. Think about it. It's the same thing, same cycle. And it gets to a tipping point, and everybody just stands up and says, no, no, we're not going to do this anymore, you know? That day is coming. Hmm. Any householder, regardless of his position, can perform this Sankirtan Yagya without expenditure. All the family members can sit down together and simply clap their hands and chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Somehow or other, everyone can manage to perform Satya Yagya and distribute prasad to the people in general. That is quite sufficient for this age of Kali. The Krishna consciousness movement is based on this principle. Chant the Hare Krishna mantra at every moment as much as possible, both inside and outside of the temples. And as far as possible, distribute prasad. This process can be accelerated with the, co with the cooperation of state administrators and those who are producing the country's wealth. Simply by liberal distribution of prasad and sankirtan, the whole world can become peaceful and prosperous. Generally, in all the material sacrifices recommended in the Vedic literature, there are offerings to the demigods. This demigod worship is especially meant for less intelligent men. Actually, the result of such sacrifice goes to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayana. Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhaktaram Yagyata Pasam, he is actually the enjoyer of all sacrifices. His name, therefore, is Yagya Purusha. Although Dhruva Maharaj was a great devotee, and had nothing to do with these sacrifices. To set an example to his people, he performed many sacrifices and gave all his wealth in charity. For as long as he lived as a householder, he never spent a farthing for his sense gratification. In this verse, the word karma pala pradam is very significant. The Lord awards everyone different kinds of karma as the individual living entities desire. He is the super-soul, present within the heart of everyone. And he is so kind and liberal that he gives everyone full facilities to perform whatever act one wants. Then the result of the action is also enjoyed by the living entity. If anyone wants to enjoy or lord it over material nature, the Lord gives him full facilities 
<clears throat> but he becomes entangled in the resultant reactions. Similarly, if one wants to engage himself fully in devotional service, the Lord gives him full facilities and the devotees enjoy, the, jo the devotee enjoys the results. The Lord is therefore known as Karma Pala Prada. Text 11. Dhruva Maharaj rendered devotional service under the supreme reservoir of everything with unrelenting force. I'll read that again. Dhruva Maharaj rendered devotional service under the supreme, the reservoir of everything with unrelenting force. While carrying out his devotional service to the Lord, he could see that everything is situated in him only and that he is situated in all living entities. The Lord is called Achuta because he never fails in his prime duty to give protection to his devotees. Purport. Not only, did, not only did Dhruva Maharaj perform many sacrifices, but he carried on his transcendental occupation of engaging in the devotional service of the Lord. The ordinary karmis who want to enjoy the results of fruitive activities are concerned only with sacrifices and ritualistic ceremonies as enjoyed in the Vedic Shastras. Although Dhruva Maharaj performed many sacrifices in order to be an exemplary king, he was constantly engaged in devotional service. The Lord always protects his surrendered devotee. A devotee can see that the Lord is situated in everyone's heart, as stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Ishwara Sarvabhutanam Rijjashara Junatishtati. Ordinary persons cannot understand how the Supreme Lord is situated in everyone's heart, but a devotee can actually see him. Not only can the devotee see him outwardly, but he can see with spiritual vision that everything is resting in the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as described in the Bhagavad Gita, Matstani Sarvabhutani. That is the vision of the Mahabhagavata. He sees everything uh, he sees everything others see, but instead of seeing merely the trees, the mountains, the cities, or the sky, he sees only his worshipable Supreme Personality of Godhead in everything, because everything is resting in him only. This is the vision of the Mahabhagavata. In summary, the Mahabhagavata <coughs> A highly elevated pure devotee sees the Lord everywhere as well as within the heart of everyone. <coughs> this is possible for devotees who have developed elevated devotional service to the Lord. As stated in the Brahma Sangita 538, only those who have smeared their eyes with the ointment of love of Godhead can see everywhere the Supreme Lord face to face. It is not possible by imagination or by so-called meditation. Text 12. Dhruva Maharaj was endowed with all good qualities. <clears throat> he was very respectful to the devotees of the Supreme Lord and very kind to the poor, poor and innocent. He is, he, and he protected religious principles. With all these qualifications, he was considered to be the direct father of all the citizens. Purport. The personal qualities of Dhruva Maharaj described herein are the exemplary qualities of a saintly king. Not only a king, but also the leaders of a modern democratic or impersonal government must be qualified with all these godly characteristics. Then, the cities of, citizens of the state can be happy. It is clearly stated here that the citizens thought of Dhruva Maharaj as their father. As a child, depending on the able father, is completely satisfied. So the citizens of the state, being protected by the state or the king, should remain satisfied in every respect. At the present moment, however, 
There is no guarantee by the government or even the <coughs> primary necessities of life in the state, namely the protection of the lives and property of the citizens. Whoa, that was pretty topical. That was written uh, fourth canto, third, 1974. just in case anyone's wondering whether or not these truths apply at all times and all circumstances. One word is very significant in this connection. Ramanyam. Dhruva Maharaj was very devoted to the Brahmanas who engage in the study of the Vedas and thereby know the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They are always busy propagating Krishna consciousness. The state should be very respectful to societies that distribute God consciousness all over the world. But unfortunately, at the present moment, there is no state or government su uh, support given to such movements. <clears throat> As for good quality to, it, qualities, it is very difficult to find anyone in state administration with any good qualities. <laughs> The administrators sim sit, simply sit in their administrative posts and say no to every request. <laughs> even, when, even when they're asking each other, right? I'll read that again. Yeah. The administrators simply sit in their administrative posts and say no to every request as if they were paid to say no to the citizens. <laughs> Oh, Krishna. Another word, if it wasn't so, I mean, it's like comic tragedy. That's what it is. It's a tragedy. Another word, Dina Vatsalam, is very significant also. The state head should be very kind to the innocent. Oh. Unfortunately, in this age, the state agents and the presidents draw good salaries from the state and they pose themselves as very pious but they allow the running of slaughterhouses where innocent animals are killed. If we try to compare the godly qualities of Dhruva Maharaj to the qualities of modern statesmen, we can see that there is no actual comparison. Dhruva Maharaj was present in the Satya Yuga, as will be clear from the next verses. He was the ideal king in Satya Yuga. The government administration in the present age, Kali Yuga, is bereft of all godly qualities. Considering all these points, the people today have no alternative but to take to Krishna consciousness for protection of religion, life, and property. Text 13. Dhruva Maharaj ruled over this planet for 36,000 years. He diminished the reactions of pious activities by enjoyment and by, and by practicing in austerities he diminished inauspicious reactions. Purport that Dhruva Maharaj ruled over the planet for 36,000 years means that he was present in the Satya Yuga because in the Satya Yuga people used to live for 100,000 years. In the next Yuga, Treta, people used to live for 10,000 years. And in the next Yuga, Dwapara, for 1,000 years. In the present age, the Kali Yuga, the maximum duration of life is 100 years. With the change of the Yugas, the duration of life in memory, the quality of kindness, and all other good qualities diminish. There are two kinds of activities, namely pious and impious. By executing pious activities, one can gain facilities for higher material enjoyment. But due to pi impious activities, one has to undergo severe distress. A devotee, however, is not interested in enjoyment or affected by distress. When he is prosperous, he knows, I am diminishing the results of my pious activities. And when he is in distress, he knows, I am diminishing the reactions of my impious activities. A devotee is not concerned with enjoyment or distress. He simply desires to execute devotional service. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam that devotional service should be apratiyata, unchecked by the material conditions of happiness 
or distress. The devotee under, undergoes processes of austerity, such as observing ekadashi and similar other fasting days, and refraining from illicit sex life, intoxication, gambling, and meat eating. Thus he becomes purified from the reactions of his past impious life. And because he engages in devotional service, which is the top, is the most pious activity, he enjoys life without separate endeavor. 14. The self-controlled great soul Dhruva Maharaj thus passed many, many years favorably executing three kinds of worldly activities, namely religiosity, economic development, and satisfaction of all material desires. Thereafter, he handed over the charge of the royal throne to his son. Purport. Perfection of materialistic life is suitably attained by the process of observing religious principles. This leads automatically to successful economic development and thus there is no difficulty in satisfying all material desires. Since Dhruva Maharaj, as a king, had to keep up his status quo or it would not have been possible to real, rule over the people in general, he did it perfectly. But as soon as he saw that his son was grown up and could take charge of the royal throne, he immediately handed over the charge and retired from all material activities. One word used here is very significant. Avichalendriya, which means that he was not disturbed by the agitation of the senses, nor was his sensory power diminished, although in years he was a very old man. Since he ruled over the world for 36,000 years, naturally one may conclude that he became very, very old, but factually his senses were very young and he was not interested in sense gratification. In other words, he remained self-controlled. He performed his duties perfectly according to the materialistic way. That is the way of the behavior, that is the way of behavior of great devotees. Srila Raghunath Das Goswami, one of the direct disciples of Lord Chaitanya, was the son of a very rich man although he had no interest in enjoying material happiness. When he was entrusted with doing something in managing the state, he did it perfectly. Srila Gora Sundar advised him, from within, keep yourself and your mind completely aloof, from ex but externally, execute the material duties just as they need to be done. This transcendental position can be achieved by devotees only, as described in the Bhagavad Gita while others, such as yogis, try to control their senses by force. Devotees, even though possessing full sensual, sensory powers, do not use them because they engage in higher transcendental activities. Text 15. Srila Dhruva Maharaj realized that this cosmic manifestation bewilders living entities like a dream or phantasmagoria because it is a creation of the illusory external energy of the Supreme Lord. Purport. In the deep forest, it, is sometimes, it sometimes appears that there are big palaces and nice cities. That is technically called Gandharva Nagara. Similarly, in dreams also, we create many false things out of imagination. A self-realized person or a devotee knows well that this material cosmic manifestation is a temporary, illusory representation appearing to be truth. It is like a phantasmagoria. But behind this shadow creation, there is reality, the spiritual world. A devotee is interested in the spiritual world, not its shadow. Since he has realization of the supreme truth, a devotee is not interested in this temporary shadow of truth. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, Param Drishtva Nivartate. Text 16. Thus Dhruva Maharaj at the end left his kingdom, which extended all over the earth, 
and was bounded by great oceans. He considered his body, his wife, his children, his friends, his army, his rich treasury, his very, com his, his, his very comfortable palaces and his many enjoyable pleasure grounds to be creations of the illusory energy. Thus in due course of time, he retired to the forest in the Himalaya known as Badri Gashram. That's the name of the Denver temple, Badri Gashram, because it's a mile high city, they named it like that. Purport. <clears throat> in the beginning of his life, when he went to the forest in search of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Dhruva Maharaj realized that all bodily conceptions of pleasure are products of the illusory energy. In the very beginning, of course, he was after the kingdom of his father. And in order to get it, he went to search for the Supreme Lord. But he later realized that everything is the creation of the illusory energy. From the acts of Srila Dhruva Maharaj, we can understand that somehow or other, if one becomes Krishna conscious, it does not matter what his motivation is, is in the beginning, he will eventually realize the supreme truth by the grace of the Lord. In the beginning, Dhruva Maharaj was interested in the kingdom of his father, but later he became a great devotee, Mahabhagavata, and had no interest in material enjoyment. The perfection of life can be achieved only by devotees. If one Complete, if one completes only a minute percentage of devotional service and then falls down from his immature position, he is better than a person who fully engages in the fruitive activities of this material world. Congratulations, everyone. <laughs> Text 17. In Badrik Ashram, Dhruva Maharaja's senses became completely purified because he bathed regularly in the crystal clear purified water. He fixed his sitting position and by yogic practice controlled the breathing process and the air of life. In this way his senses were completely withdrawn. He then concentrated his mind on the Archa Vigraha form of the Lord which is the exact replica of the Lord and thus meditating upon him entered into complete trance. Purport. Here is a description of the Ashtanga Yoga system to which Dhruva Maharaj was already accustomed. Ashtanga Yoga was never meant to be fa practiced in a fashionable city. Dhruva Maharaj went to Bhadrak Ashram and in a solitary place, alone, he practiced yoga. He concentrated his mind on the Archa Vigraha, the worshipable deity of the Lord, which exactly rep uh, represents the Supreme Lord. And thus thinking constantly of, that, constantly of that deity, he became absorbed in trance. Worship of the Archa Vigraha is not idol worship. The Archa Vigraha is an incarnation of the Lord in a form appreciable by, the, by a devotee. Therefore, devotees engage in the temple, in the service of the Lord, as Archa Vigraha, a form made of stula, material objects, such as stone, metal, world, wood, jewels, or paint. All of these are called stula, or physical representations. Since the devotees follow the regulatory principles of worship, even though the Lord is there in his physical form, he is non different from his original spiritual form. <coughs> thus the Lord, thus the devotee, gets the benefit of achieving the ultimate goal of life, that is to say, becoming always absorbed and thoughts of the Lord. This incessant thought of the Lord, as prescribed in the Bhagavad Gita, makes one the topmost yogi. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So we'll stop there, a reading for today, and uh, have our delightful time of reflection. Anything that stuck out in your mind during the reading? that you want to discuss further or you want to reflect on or 
Yes, sorry. <coughs> One of the purports early on is saying that there's a kind of oneness where the hand and the leg are cooperating. So there's a kind of oneness, but it's not my body oneness. So is that a chincha beta beta, or how would you? Precisely. <laughs> In other words, the hand, you can, you can see the hand and call it a hand. You can see the leg and you can call it a leg. But when the hand and the leg are doing something together, you know, to maintain the whole body, they're the body. So they're the parts of the body, and at the same time, together, it's the whole body. So that's exactly a chinta beta beta type one. <coughs> just like just like just like the tree, right? The tree has so many parts, right? But the life that's maintaining all the parts is coming from the from the root. But still, the whole tree has an identity as a tree. It has a lent to the tree at the same time it's a living being. So you can say we're all human beings. We're all one. We're all one because we're all human beings. But each one of us is different, completely different. There's not one living entity. What does speak of human beings? There's not one human being that's the same. Look at just look around. Yeah, just look around and see <laughs> the inconceivable energy of Krishna. Every one of us is a human being and yet every single one of us is completely different. Even identical twins. You look at them, they're, they're different. Each, each and every one. This is inconceivable energy of the Lord. So we identify as one, as human beings, but at the same time we're each individual person. Yes. Hannah. Sometimes whenever people say we're all one, they're also including the plants and the animals and all the living entities. Do you think that they're misidentifying uh, Krishna within the heart of every living entity as one themselves? Because that's why people say, oh, I am God. And, and it's not what I think. It's not what I think. It's given in the Bhagavad Gita. Somebody has a Gita? Krishna explains this exactly. This is what I'm trying to emphasize by reading the books every day and, and referring to them. Because it's not what we think. If we learn to think thoughts that are consistent with these books, then our thoughts change. And they explain things properly. So I'm going to hopefully find this verse as soon as possible. Uh, <coughs> yes, 18th chapter. Understanding. Maybe a bit to look it up. Understanding. There's three types of understanding. Well, there's a lot of variety, but they can be divided into three. Basic understanding. Understanding in goodness, understanding in passion, and understanding in ignorance. Oops. Yes. <coughs> 
O Sen of Prita, this is 1830. O Sen of Prita, that understanding by which one, wait, knowledge. Knowledge. Yes. Got it. That knowledge by which one undivided spiritual nature is seen in all living entities, though they are divided into innumerable forms, you should understand to be in the mode of goodness. Purport. A person who sees one spirit soul in every living being, whether a demigod, human being, animal, bird, beast, aquatic, or plant, possesses knowledge in the mode of goodness. In all living entities, one spirit soul is there, although they have different bodies in terms of their previous work. As described in the... But that one doesn't mean it's the same living entity. It means in quality the same spiritual energy. As described in the seventh chapter, the manifestation of the living force in everybody is due to the spiritual superior nature of the Supreme Lord. Thus to see that one superior nature, that living force in everybody, is to see in the mode of goodness. That living en energy is imperishable, although the bodies are perishable. Differences are perceived in terms of the body because they are many forms of material existence in conditional life. The living force appears to be divided. Such impersonal knowledge is an aspect of self-realization. 21. That knowledge by which one sees that in every different body there is a different type of living entity. When you should you should understand to be in the mode of passion. Purport. The concept that the material body is the living entity, and that with the, with the destruction of the body, the consciousness is also destroyed, is called knowledge in the mode of passion. According to that knowledge, bodies differ from one another because of the development of different types of consciousness. In a, a, otherwise, there is no separate soul which manifests consciousness. The body is itself the soul, and therefore there is no separate soul beyond the body. According to such knowledge, consciousness is temporary. Or else there are no individual souls, but there is an all-pervading soul which is full of knowledge, and this body is a manifestation of temporary ignorance. Or beyond this body, there is no special individual or supreme soul. All such conceptions are considered products of the mode of passion. 22. And that knowledge by which one is attached to one kind of work as all in all, without knowledge of the truth, and which is very meager, is said to be in the mode of darkness. Purport. The knowledge of the common man is always in the mode of darkness or ignorance because every living entity in conditional life is born into the mode of ignorance. One who does not develop knowledge through the authorities or scriptural injunctions has knowledge that is limited to the body. He is not concerned about acting in terms of the directions of scripture. For him, God is money. <laughs> and knowledge means the satisfaction of bodily demands. Such knowledge has no connection with the absolute truth. It is more or less like the knowledge of, an ordin of ordinary animals. The knowledge of eating, sleeping, defending, and mating. Such knowledge is described here as the product of the mode of darkness. In other words, knowledge is described as a product, oh, in other words, knowledge concerning the spirit soul 
beyond this body is called knowledge in the mode of goodness. Knowledge producing many theories and doctrines uh, by dint of mundane logic and mental speculation is the product of the mode of bad. That's why I protested when you said, what, how, what do you think about this? Or what? Mm. In other words, knowledge concerning the spirit soul beyond this body is called knowledge in the mode of goodness. Knowledge producing many theories and doctrines by dint of mundane logic and mental speculation is in the product of passion. We have a, an, another saintly person coming? <laughs> Who is that? Huh? He touched his brush. He ran away? Okay. Okay. We have to keep our concentration now. This is what happens as soon as something happens and we lost our concentration. Do you remember what we were talking about? Anybody? It's a, it's, it's a summary of the mode of ignorance. Well, it's a summary of all three, but it's in the verse about mode of ignorance. Uh, in other words, knowledge concerning the spirit soul beyond this body is called knowledge in the mode of goodness. Knowledge producing many theories and doctrines by dint of mundane logic and mental speculation is the product of the mode of passion. And knowledge concerning only with keeping the body comfortable is said to be in the mode of ignorance. That's what I think. <laughs> So does that answer the question? Really? What was the question? Do you think Mayavadi philosophers get Krishna within their heart confused as themselves? The reason I ask is because... Yes, yes. But that wasn't exactly what you asked. You were talking about something else. And but my other question was... Wait. That my, my first question was, is if Mayavadi philosophers, basically, if they get... Krishna within their own heart confused as themselves yes. and and seeing Krishna within the heart of every living entity considering them considering Krishna within the heart of every living entity as themselves and then seeing it within every other living entity they just automatically assume we're all one and there's only one soul and we're just split up into that was my <coughs> question precisely speaking thank you very much it was very well said that's exactly what the that's exactly what the Mayavadis think. They 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 think that there's only one soul, right? And they they know that they're they accept that they're a soul, but then they think that you put us all together. When they hear that we're a part parcel, then they think if we put us all together, then we become Krishna. Or another way of putting it is, if you, you but the soul can't be cut by pieces. Chindandi, naiva chindandi shastrani, nainam dahadi pavaka, the chainam kledyantyapo. China means to cut. You can't cut spirit into pieces. It's not cleavable. It's not changeable. So, the, but they're thinking there's one God, you know, and there's one spirit, and therefore he cuts himself into pieces and distributes it everywhere, just like if you take a piece of paper and you put, you know, turn tires into a lot of pieces and then throw it to the wind, there's no more piece of paper. Yeah. So they don't, because, because they're comparing the concept of God as a person to themselves. That's the, the root cause of ignorance. They compare themselves to God, or compared God to themselves. And they can't imagine how a person can be present in one place and be simultaneously in many places. Because I can't be here and in my room down the, down the thing at the same time, exactly. So yes, the Mayavadis make this mistake of thinking that they are uh, Krishna and that if we put us all together, then we become the actual one Krishna. But that's the same thing as I was just describing in Bhagavad Gita, when they see a different soul in each kind of body, a different kind of soul. Mm -hmm. They don't see spirit as the unchangeable, 
individual distinct uh, personality with the body. They think the body is the personality. Yeah. The reason why I asked is because I was talking to this woman this weekend and she was explaining that she felt confused because she said a lot of people nowadays call their soul their higher self like whenever they're acting as their soul they call it them their higher self but she was like I'm confused because sometimes she's because I was explaining to her that God is within your heart situated right next to your soul and she said sometimes I feel confused is who is who's giving me guidance who's is it who? my yeah who's who and I said chance is mantra and it'll be you the distinction will become very clear well if you when you meet somebody like that and explain a very simple idea that is from the Vedas that is from the Upanishads that the body is like a tree and there's two birds living in the tree one of the birds is interested in the fruit of the tree. The other bird is not interested in the fruit of the tree. And then in the 13th chapter, Krishna explains very clearly that there's, there's the individual bird in the tree is conscious of that body. But the Supreme Soul is conscious of all bodies at the same time. So if I pinch myself, you can't feel it. If you pinch yourself, I can't feel it because we're individual souls, embodied souls, individual, and our consciousness is limited to this body. <coughs> but the this, this difference between the individual soul and the supreme soul, the super soul, is that he's conscious of all the bodies. If When you pinch your body, he feels it. When I pinch my body, he feels it. He knows what's going on everywhere. And that's because he is present everywhere by his expansion. Just like the sun is in one place in the sky, and the photons which emanate from the sun, each of which is, has light and heat, just like the sun, but only a tiny in, infinitesimal amount. But you put them all together, and it's the sunshine. So God is expanding himself into expansions and going into the hearts of all living entities simultaneously. So he's simultaneous in one place, and he's simultaneously everywhere. When I, when I gave that example to her, she started to cry. Exactly. Well done. Well done. As soon as they start crying, when they hear something like that, you know you're, you're getting somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, when uh, Prabhupada had this, this famous conversation with Cardinal Danilu in, in Paris in 1974, you know, he pinned him, just pinned him, Prabhupada. He said, how can you kill the animals? And he said openly, well, the animals don't have souls. Mm -hmm. And then Prabhupada said, what's the difference between a living being with a soul and a living being without the soul? What's the difference? And he just uh, he just got tongue-tied. He couldn't say anything. And then, you know, Thought, turned to his secretary and started to make arrangements to go, you know. <laughs> it was so hilarious. But Prabhupada wouldn't let him go. And he just kept nailing him and nailing him. And you could see him literally fidgeting in his chair and, you know, feeling uncomfortable. You remember? It's, it's there. It's right there on a video. Yeah. There's a video of it. Not very long after that, this man was found dead in the arms of a prostitute. Cardinal Danilo. Cardinal? Cardinal. <laughs> okay, wait, we got some things going on over here. Okay, Shweta Dweep. Take it away. Um, in the 15th verse that we read today, uh, Srila Dhruva Maharaja realized that, his, that this cosmic manifestation bewilders living entities like a dream or phantasmagoria because it is a, a creation of illusory external energy of the Supreme Lord. Uh, my question is like sometimes this material world is compared to daydream uh, so as we get dreams in the night which is not really true similarly the interactions that we have in this material world are compared to dream so uh, 
is that because it is not real or eternal you know it's described that when mahavishnu while the, the material creation is going on what is he doing it's called yoga nidra he looks like he's sleeping but he's not sleeping and in one breath all the material cosmic manifestations are created all the 311 trillion years of time go on and then it gets re 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 rewound back into his body <coughs> meantime he's thinking about you know his pastimes in the spiritual <laughs> world and we are living in his dream yoga nidra so that in this way if you analyze yourself really carefully according to shastra analyze analytically all the things that you can do and all the thi all the potencies that you have that you can do and then you extrapolate that imagine a person who could do <coughs> that but unlimitedly with no restrictions then you'd come to some conception of Krishna. That's why it's recommended that we don't try to understand Krishna first. We try to understand ourselves and the material nature and how it all works. And then extrapolate. And you see, you can have dream. Krishna can have dream also. The difference is you're dreaming just a little thing and he's dreaming the whole cosmic manifestation. We can, we can sweat when it gets too hot. Of course, now it's not much sweating going on because it's too cold. But when it gets really hot and we try to do something, you know, we can sweat a little bit. And probably if you accumulated it all, we could put a little bit in a glass of water so we can produce water from this body. Then Krishna's body produces the garbage of the ocean. So like this, if you just analyze every little thing and go into it in detail, systematically, then you gradually you'll understand. And the picture of who God is will become more and more clear. And as it becomes clear, then you become more clear about what you are in relationship to Him. And then you go, oh, maybe I shouldn't be so <coughs> proud of all these things that I could do. Because I'm really dependent. But still I can go over here. Or I can go over there. Or I can decide to do this. Or I can decide to do that. So Krishna, he's completely independent. So we can't just do whatever we want, go at whenever we want, and do whatever we want. It's not possible. We're thinking like that. That's the way. And we're thinking that because we can do that, goes to your point, then we're thinking we're God because we can create this microphone or we can, you know, whatever. Nowadays that they do. 5G. For soon we'll have 5G. Then everything will be okay. <laughs> during, the, <laughs> during the, uh, I don't know if you know anything about Indian history. Some of you are in Indian bodies may know, may remember this. But when Indira Gandhi was the prime minister of India, at one point, in order to distract from her mismanagement and the way the economy was going, she declared this emergency, national emergency, and she was doing all kinds of crazy things to control the, the population and all these things. She was doing crazy things. And, uh, oh my God, I lost my train of thought. Hare Krishna, where was I going? No, no, no. <laughs> yes, yes. So then there was like a national emergency and everybody was freaking out. So she went on the television, I and mean, she went on the, I don't know what it was then. I, anyway, she gave a speech. I don't remember where it was exactly. And she said, don't worry, because in just a few months, you'll have television. Mm -hmm. And that was her solution to satisfy the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, there it is, the conch shell of Maya. They're carrying televisions from one place to another. <laughs> hey.
Hey, Uncle John, I got something for me over there. Yeah, Here, give him, give, him the, give him the thing. <coughs> I like the way that, I guess, uh, Kuvera was, came back and told, told, uh, Druva, actually, you have not killed the Yakshas, nor have you killed your brother, nor have they killed your brother. For the ultimate cause of generation and annihilation is the eternal time feature of the Supreme Lord. He's trying to diffuse this blood feud, I guess, between those two, so they won't keep going back and forth, killing each other. But this is already done. It's already done, yeah, yeah. but he... But what he's saying was, you, you think, you, you're thinking they were killed, but they weren't killed. Right. His soul is not, does not die. And, and really, and then he goes, this time is what actually kills people anyway. Yeah. The, the, he said, the nice time is what kills people ultimately. So it's like, you're going to die anyway. So why, you know, don't, you're, you're not to blame. Neither is the Yakshas to blame because yeah. time is to blame. Yeah. So, I just thought that was a. I don't. Know, I thought about vengeance is mine, says the Lord. In in that, for some reason, like it was, you know, if you have ought against somebody, you know, that's done something that somebody that's killed a family member or some horrific incident, it's like time is going to get them anyway. Eventually, yeah, you, you know. You, you apply that. Apply that thought to the Bhagavad Gita, the teachings of the Gita. You know, all through the Gita, one of the things that Krishna stresses is that the soul never dies. So you shouldn't lament for the dying because the soul never dies. Just the bag of chemicals. Once the soul leaves the body, they they put the, they cut you. There's a law. You have to dispose of the body like really fast because it'll. It'll make you sick if you hang around it for very long it, when it starts to decompose, you know. And then Krishna came, and once he was, he was already convinced, in the 10th chapter he says, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram, Param Bhamam. You are the supreme absolute truth, the abode, the everything. You're the, you're the, um, and then 11th chapter, then he asks Krishna to see the universal form. And then Krishna shows how he enters as time into everything. And, and Arjun could see from one place in one position of the universe everything past, present, and future at the same time. That'd be enough to blow your mind. And it did. It blew his mind. And then at one point, Arjun said, Oh, excuse me. <laughs> and he said, Who are you? <laughs> Would, I don't know what your mission is. And then Krishna said, Time I am. And I've come here to destroy everyone. So just fight. It's already done. And in that vision, he saw Dhritarashtra and all the soldiers, even his own soldiers. He saw them, you know, rushing into the, into the mouth of time. You know? It's mind-boggling. So I sit there and just mull on that for a yeah, while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It can sober us up, huh? Yeah. It, it mind sobers us up. Matthew. That pastime of A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Srila Prabhupada, with the Cardinal, uh, reminded me about how Krishna said, abandon all forms of religion and surrender unto me. Uh, was Krishna like saying, just like, abandon the like institutions of religion, and uh, but uphold the principles? Or, or was it to let's see the underlying uh, absolute truth? Yes, when, see, Krishna explained uh, religious principles in terms of the duties that we have according to the bodies we've acquired. Huh? So therefore, uh, he appealed to Krishna in different ways. He appealed to him philosophically, uh, karmically, uh, he appealed to his, to his pride, 
if you if you leave the battlefield now, what's going to happen? They're all going to think you're just running away like a coward, you know. And you know you're a very respected warrior. You're the topmost warrior, and you're going to you're going to think very bad of yourself when all these people start to think of Achavadam Chabahun, Vidishanti Tvahitaha, Nindantas, Tavasarmatjam, Tato Dukadadam Nukim. What could be more harmful, painful for you than to hear others? speaking to you about you in a deriding way. So like that, all the different dharmas and activities and feelings that we have all through the material world, he said, give those all up. And then, you know, Arjun was rejecting one after the other. And the yoga system he completely rejected. So what we just heard about Dhruva, that we did Ashtanga Yoga, and then, you know, you know, went back went into trance and went back to Godhead. <coughs> Actually we didn't hear everything. Maybe there is something still. Yeah, there's still something left. <coughs> when he steps on the head of death. You know, the grim reaper comes, you know. <laughs> when Drupal was about ready to get on the airplane, spiritual airplane, and the grim reaper comes and he just goes, boom, and steps on his head and steps right under the airplane and then goes back to the spiritual world. <laughs> you know? So yeah, Sarva Dharma Marichama means whatever you're doing, whatever your duties you're doing, just do it for me. That's it. And then, and then you transcend all the individual dharmas and different duties you think you have and responsibilities and attachments and all that. If you just do it for Krishna, then Krishna will give you intelligence how to uh, na- navigate your way through all those things and come to him at the end. Okay, we have one more from... From cyberspace, I wonder who it's going to be. Any guesses? Rati Manjari. Rati Manjari, by the way, it's the first time. <laughs> How you go, Rati? Dear She's Guru. She's been going out, <coughs> by the way, inspired by this reading. She goes out by herself. You know, you do the Harinam second. She goes out by herself in Amsterdam and just sings and goes and just walks around. I'm, just, I'm singing the holy name in her. She's a really good singer. So good. She's a really good singer. She's a pro, professional singer. She sings the high nam. And it's so wonderful. Okay, Adrati. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. I have a reflection about the impersonalists and also a question. When I first read and heard of Srila Prabhupada criticizing the bogus gurus who gave out mantras for money and made people think they would become God in six months, I didn't relate to it so much because it did not happen or occur to me. Somehow, in my ignorance, I thought these practices these practices, to be something of the 60s. Yet recently, I have seen a few examples of exactly this going on with apparently famous YouTube gurus. This <laughs> makes me realize <laughs> that she... YouTube guru, that's a good one. <laughs> This makes me realize that also, this point in Srila Prabhupada's preaching, sadly, is still completely relevant today. This means that many thousands of people are seriously practicing these things. My question to you is, do you recommend a particular way to preach to the impersonalistic gurus and to those more innocent persons who are influenced by impersonalistic philosophy? Well, that's a really big question. Uh, you know, there's no... It's not... This is not a empiric formula that you can't come up with one answer for that because each each individual person has to be just like we have a doctor in the room, at least one. Yeah, you're the only one today. Today you're the only doctor. Sometimes we have more than one. You know, she got medicine, you know, but she doesn't just give, and she's got a whole stock of medicine. And you don't give just you know any medicine to anybody in any quantity. First, we have to di- diagnose the person and what the medicine, I- what the disease is, and what the, what the, uh, how do you say, how far, the, how it's gone, how far it's gone, how, how, what's, what's the word? Duration. Yeah, duration and the intensity or the or the or the severity. severity. Thank you. Yeah, the severity of the disease, you know, and uh, <coughs> like that when we're preaching, you know, that's why we have to actually know these books to preach properly you know 
to preach very ex extensively and properly to all kinds of people and take them as far as we can. We have to learn the books because it's like got all the medicine. <laughs> The Bhagavad Gita. Mainly it's the Gita. It's got all the medicine. You know, and you just have to learn how to say the right part of it to the right person to take to get them to take a step forward. Some people may be able to hear a lot. You may be able to explain to them right away that Krishna's God and no, you're not <laughs> you're not this but anyway, some people may only be able to hear about how you must be different than the body, you know? Where, where's your where's your baby body now? Duh. <laughs> you know, most people they don't even think like that. They, they don't even think like that. They've been trained from their from their early education that you know they you know I have the same body. It just grew. <laughs> really? But how is that possible? Every single cell has changed. Oh, <laughs> duh. <laughs> you know. So anyway. Yeah, so Mayavadi philosophers who are hardcore, you're not going to convince them of anything. Because one of the teachings of the Mayavadi philosophers is they teach, it doesn't matter, it's all one, it's all the same. There is no, all, anything with the form is illusion. I mean, Jiva Goswami gives a kind of basic way to unravel the Mayavadi philosophy through an example. But it's a little bit over our time, and if I get into that, it's going to take too much time for me to do. But basically, it's like this. You know, when you you see uh, either a mirage, like you see water in the desert, or even in a hot pavement sometimes you'll see water, it's not that the water is uh, false. Water is true, but it just is somewhere else. So, like the material world, there's forms, and it means there must be real forms somewhere, but they're not here. Like when they make counterfeit money, the fact that there's a counterfeit $100 bill means that there's a real $100 bill. The, the, the word counterfeit implies in it that there is a real dollar bill. So the Mayavadis have a big problem because they're thinking it's all one and all of this is illusion and there's no two things, there's only one thing. But they're seeing a whole bunch of things in front of their eyes. So how do they do that? How, you know, already there's a duality. There's me and there's you, or there's me and there's this. You know, so they've got this crazy philosophy that makes no sense, and you can't make sense out of it, and therefore most devotees hear it and they say, no, and they just go away, and that's what you should do. Because if you sit and talk to them, unless you're very, very expert, very, very expert, you know the philosophy and can deal with all of their word jugglery, because some of them are very, very expert word jugglers, because it first came from Lord Shiva, the mind well philosophy. He's very expert. <laughs> he did it on the instruction of Krishna to bewilder us all. So it's a big subject and there's lots of things to say about it. But basically, if there are forms, there must be real forms. If there are temporary forms, there must be real forms. That's the basic thing. If, if there was only one soul, right, and we're all just cut up and there's actually only we're God, then with one of us liberated, all the rest of it should automatically become liberated. But it doesn't happen like that. <laughs> what, does, what does Gopi Purana Dana Prabhu say about spiritual variegatedness? He says, he says, uh, real liberation or oneness is when we merge into the uh, spiritual varieties of the spiritual world when we merge into the spiritual variety, variegatedness <coughs> of Vaikuntha. But with that, I hope I answered that something, Rati, because it's a big subject. And plus I got, you know, I got to go. But uh, thank you so much, everybody. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. 
Dhruva Maharaj Liberation Ki Jai, Samabeda Bhakta Binda Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Go Premanandi. We'll see you tomorrow night at 6.30 Central Time in the USA. Hare Krishna.